Ray swore an oath to God to protect his name, his followers, and his kingdom. The military orders of the Crusades answered the call when threat of annihilation was hanging in the balance. In an all-new series, James and Joanna Bogle discuss the heroic efforts of the defense of ancient Christendom. You know, Europe is attacked from the north, from the south, from the east, uh, from, you know, and from the north, northeast as well. We really, literally had attacks on all sides. So arose the military orders and the Crusades, an all-new series here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Welcome again to the Military Orders and the Crusades. I'm Joanna Bogle and I'm working on this with my husband Jamie and today we're going to look at the rise of Islam. Well first of all Jamie we were looking at the situation, the geopolitical situation of Europe and the Middle East uh, before the Crusades. So let's just talk about what we're saying the Middle East, the, the Holy Land, was not originally Islamic. It wasn't made Islamic when it was first created. This was the land where Christ lived and worked, and it was where Christianity was born, and this was Christian territory. Yes, and of course where he suffered and died, uh, which is the foundation, of course, of the Christian religion. Uh, one might say that the Middle East is, the, if you like, the cradle of perhaps all of the great world religions, with a few exceptions, obviously Buddhism, Taoism, um, but Judaism, uh, Islam, even Zoroastrianism, and of course above all Christianity, <coughs> has its roots in the Middle East. So we're talking about a place that's sacred not only to Islam and Judaism, but also to Christianity. Um, and there is of course a continuity between Judaism and Christianity, but not quite the same continuity with Islam. Islam is a very different thing. Uh, although it appears to draw a lot of inspiration, if that's the right word, looking at the Quran and uh, the, the traditions, uh, the Hadith, um, one sees a lot that is in, in common with Christianity, even with Judaism, uh, uh, and perhaps parts of Zoroastrianism and other Eastern religions, but of course parts also that are very different. Islam itself regards itself as very different, because Islam itself regards itself as uh, the final revelation. And here, then, we immediately have uh, a clash of ideologies, a clash of belief systems, of religions, uh, which is often, of course, the source of greatest clashes but, uh, amongst men. But we also see, in the case of Islam, we see uh, a concept not only of spreading, uh, as it were, <laughs> the, the message of Islam, uh, which other religions have in common, particularly, of course, Christianity, uh, to some extent Judaism, other religions, of course, don't necessarily have a uh, desire to spread their message. But Islam also has another characteristic in that it, it does not consider it in, I, intrinsically wrong to spread uh, its message by conquest. And as many historians have commented, the spread of Islam uh, through military conquest, first of all of the Middle East, Mesopotamia, then the Eastern Empire, then the whole of North Africa, through into Spain, right the way up to France, it gets as far as Tours very nearly goes into uh, Paris. We see Muslim raiders uh, as far north as uh, the, the British Isles. Uh, this is something that was unprecedented and probably something we haven't seen uh, in quite the same way in, other, in history uh, ever before or since. It was a remarkable change. It was a remarkable development. Uh, and for those who were subject to the conquest, by Islam, of course, uh, it was a very dramatic change. Let's go right back then to the beginnings of Islam. The word itself means submission, submission to God. 
and it is a monotheistic religion. It believes in one God, uh, something that we can today say we, we share with Islam. There is but one God, and of course the Jews were the first. Uh, they had, there is one God, there is one God. But we need to understand how it all began. So take us back to the beginnings of Islam. Well, it begins with uh, the birth of Muhammad, who is the, the, the prophet of Islam, uh, and he begins his preaching we're in about his 40th year, in about the year 612. Um, his preaching is considered subversive by the neighbouring pagan religions and also by Christianity in the Eastern Empire. Now let's remember that all of Mesopotamia, most of Mesopotamia, is in Christian hands uh, with incursions from uh, pre-Muslim uh, and, and but post-Christian pagan powers, such as the Persians, for example, they were not originally Muslims, they were pagan fire worshippers uh, in the time, for example, of King Khosros, who uh, sacked Jerusalem and stole uh, the true cross. Uh, we see hostility to this new message, this message of Islam. And so, uh, Muhammad uh, is forced to flee from his birthplace of Mecca to Medina. Uh, and this flight, or in uh, Arabic Hegira, is the beginning really of uh, the religion of Islam as, uh, as a timeline. And this is from that, were they number their years? It is. And that, that took place in 622. And of course we see um, uh, uh, Muslim pilgrims to this day go and visit Mecca, particularly around that, that time, but at other times as well. And, and it is from this that we begin, we see the beginnings of uh, uh, of Islam and we see the beginnings of the Arab Muslim Caliphate which begins not only to, to uh, expand within its own immediate region but then threatens the Persian Empire. Remember the Persians were, uh, as we said in the last ep uh, episode, were defeated by the Byzantine Emperor Her Heraclius. The True Cross brought back to Jerusalem. This weakened the Persian Empire and we then see uh, the new religion of Islam which catches on very quickly. Something that's um, for which, of course, there are no easy explanations. Islam will say it's because they, it's the true religion. Uh, but for Christianity, it's, it's because, the, who can say, but there are various theories, because the region had become corrupted, because there was a lot of uh, Christian heresies extant, Nestorianism, Eutychianism, uh, and others, which, in, the, in, in their own way, led to the, uh, a situation which gave, as it were, a vacuum for a new religion to to rise up and challenge all of them, which is what, in effect, uh, Islam uh, did. Um, and we see um, the Muslim Arab Caliphate, and the Caliphs are the successors uh, of, uh, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, beginning, first of all, with the conquest of Persia, uh, and then of Christian Iraq and Syria. And let us never forget that Iraq and Syria were Christian before they were ever Muslim. They were parts of the Eastern Roman Empire and they had been Christian for a long time, long, long, long before uh, Northern Europe, uh, before the British, for example, were Christian. Uh, and even to this day, we still have Christian Arabs in, and Christian Iraqis in the Middle East. They are, if you like, the successors of those who were living at that time. And they were conquered by Islam, uh, an expanding and expansive religion who, as, we, as I've said, uh, w w was quite willing to spread its word by the sword. And just to put this in context, all of this rapid expansion, this, as you say, rather extraordinary expansion, even in the first hundred years, this spread by the sword, extremely rapid, was taking place in what had been uh, Christian territory and before some parts of Europe were Christian. For example, the, uh, the, 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 the people of Europe, if they looked at the map, would have said that the pagans were those pale blonde people up in Scandinavia, for example, or Germany. Or Germany. Um, but they would have said the Christians were the people, for example, of the Middle East. Very ancient uh, Christian traditions there by that time. Um, and now these were falling to Islam. So this idea that we have of the modern map is not so helpful to us. We really have to see things as they were at that time with this rapid expansion. And we, we need to particularly remember that, that Jerusalem and the places that are sacred to Christianity, of course also now uh, to Islam and of course to, to, to Judaism as well, but they, th that city and those places 
were firmly part of the Eastern Roman Empire, firmly part of the Christian uh, Empire, Christendom, the Kingdom of Christ, on earth, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, and had been for hundreds and hundreds of years before the arrival of Islam in, in, well, approximately 622. But very rapidly we see a change. We see Islam ousting first the Persians, then the Christians. 635, the Arab Muslims capture the city of Damascus from the, from the Byzantines. We think of Damascus today as an Islamic city. It was at that time most certainly thought of as a Christian city, the city of St. Paul. Saul of Damascus became uh, St. Paul of Christianity, taken in 635 by the Arab Muslims. 636, the very following year, the Battle of Yarmouk, the Byzantine commander, Banias, appointed by the Emperor Heraclius, is, Heraclius by then is old, is soundly defeated by Islam. Very serious battle loss to the Byzantine Christian Empire. And then in 637, Jerusalem itself falls to the invading Muslim forces. This is what is going on. This is, uh, 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 there is no uh, need to be in any doubt here. This is a very clear invasion force come to take the sacred places from Jews and Christians uh, and ultimately to invade the Christian Roman Empire. And this also means that they're getting nearer to Europe, to places that are familiar to us as, as part of, as it were, Christian um, the Christian heritage of Europe and, and places that are familiar to us today. And of, of course some of the great events also end up shaping the world and the map as we know it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in 1711 when Tariq uh, 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 lands on the giant rock that juts out into the uh, Mediterranean. 7-11. 7-11, what did I say? 17. <laughs> no, 7-11. Um, when it's uh, Yabal Tariq, Tariq's mountain. Yes, which, which gives course, us the modern word of Gibraltar, indeed. Um, well, even before then, we see many. We see gradual encroachment of uh, of Islam in a very aggressive manner, uh, particularly the invasion of North Africa. The word Africa comes from an Arabic word, if Ifriqiya. Uh, Sicily is attacked. Uh, we see Muslim raiders harassing the coast of southern Europe. Then begins the all too familiar pattern of raids on southern Europe. For, the, for centuries afterwards, in which uh, uh, Christians, including children, women, are snatched away and turned into slaves. Later, the young boys turn into Muslim warriors, the Janissaries, uh, and uh, this becomes a familiar theme, the Islamic Muslim raiders across the coast of Europe from the very beginning, for centuries. Uh, this is, this is uh, something which plainly requires a defensive force, which of course leads on to the uh, origins of the Crusades. But we must remember and follow the timeline uh, of the advance of the forces uh, of Islam. They, they thereafter, uh, we see them uh, uh, laying siege to Constantinople. The first siege of Constantinople is as early as 668, not long after the Hegira itself. And uh, if it weren't for the uh, Byzantine invention of the Greek fire, which is a fire that could not be put out with water, you had to put it out with vinegar, because it was a combination of sulphur and naphtha, uh, then Constantinople may well have fallen. It was only uh, uh, the superiority of, uh, well, um, among other things, the superiority of technology, which saved uh, Constantinople um, from the uh, Islamic attacks. Eventually, of course, Constantinople, Constantinople does fall. Uh, we see attacks on Spain from Africa. We see the conquest of Morocco, we see uh, uh, the foundation of the great Muslim dynasties, the Umayyad dynasty, founded by uh, uh, Muawiyah, and he becomes the caliph. He moves his capital from Mecca to Damascus. Later on, it's moved from Damascus to Baghdad. Uh, and we see the, the, the foundations of the Sunni branch of Islam, uh, which places itself upon these early caliphs, Omar, Uthman, uh, Abu Bakr, uh, uh, and in contrast, of course, the, the Shiites who reject these early caliphs and prefer to focus on the divine right of, of Ali uh, and uh, Hassan, Hussein, and uh, the, the, the Fatimists. Um, and we then beget, we begin to see the division in this Islam itself of the, the, the great division that continues to this day between Sunni and Shia. Islam itself, eventually, when it becomes very big, 
starts to have wars within itself. Um, that's nothing new. Christianity, of course, experienced the same thing. But what, what is a constant theme is the spread of Islam uh, by, uh, by military force. So we really have it now coming from where it began, you know, all around Mecca and Medina and so on. It's now reaching, well, the shores of Europe, but also making very considerable incursions. And in fact, this idea of the Saracen pirates abducting children, that becomes very much part of uh, European, also British uh, legend and, and uh, stories and also of facts, reflected, of course, in the racial patterns of, of Europe and North Africa and so on to, to this day. Um, and by 846, we've got a Muslim for force approaching Rome itself. So there is this whole um, sort of steady incursion into, into mainland Europe and all around the Mediterranean and indeed beyond. Well, that's right. And we, we also see as, uh, as the, the uh, conquering uh, armies go forward, uh, other nations decide to get, as it were, with the strength. And the Berbers, for example, the dwellers in uh, northern Africa, originally were, or many of them were, Christian. They decide that they will convert to Islam. Uh, and, and they then become one of the principal raiding forces, uh, the so-called Barbary Corsairs. Mm. Barbary and Berber, similar word, same, well, effectively it's the same people. Uh, and the Barbary Corsairs going up and down enslaving uh, peoples of uh, Christian Europe by the, their maritime raids uh, on southern Europe. Um, they were uh, really, I suppose it's fair to say, a permanent force throughout the Mediterranean, and one which required, uh, on the part of the Christians, uh, a naval force, subsequently supplied, uh, supplied by uh, one of the religious military orders, the Knights Hospitaller, um, in order to police the Mediterranean from these Barbary corsairs. But going back to the time shortly after the fall of Gibraltar, when, as you mentioned, uh, Tariq invades, Tariq uh, uh, later invades Spain and uh, he kills the Visigothic king, King Rodrigo, or Roderick, um, at the Battle of Guadalete. That's in 711. So it's still not long after uh, the, the very origins uh, of Islam, only a hundred years or less than a hundred years later. We, we've, we see them uh, already uh, successfully invading Visigothic Spain, a Christian kingdom, uh, and uh, pushing them further and further back. And by 715, it's only four years later, uh, Spain is virtually entirely in Muslim hands and remains so, let us not forget, for the next 780 years. It's, uh, it's a remarkable fact, but true, that uh, Spain was probably, for at least as much of its history, uh, is Islamic as it was Christian. And you conquest. see evidence of this today in, in the very remarkable buildings and uh, sudden magnificence and so on, which is, yes. which is left today, well worth seeing. Well, one thing we've left out of the factoring in as well is the invasion of, during this initial stage of the advance of Islam, uh, of Alexandria. Alexandria was one of the great cities of the Eastern Roman Empire and housed the University of Alexandria which, which was the Harvard or the Oxford if you like of the uh, Byzantine Roman Empire and had a huge library oh, yes. which was burnt by the invading Muslim forces. Um, they, this is sometimes denied but uh, there's a little bit doubt about it because for example a Christian uh, uh, theologian and scientist uh, like John Philoponus we don't have extant any of his uh, works, or we, we, we only know about his works through the, the writings of those who tried to oppose him, because m so many of his books, as with so many other Christian books, were burnt during the, uh, uh, the uh, invasion of Alexandria and the destruction of the university. The Muslim leaders themselves said and threatened that they would water their horses and stable them in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, we mustn't, this is this is what is so often left out of the uh, history of the Crusades. And so what had begun as this revelation to the Prophet uh, and then this, this flight to Medina became very rapidly this swiftly 
growing religion, uh, taking in its path not only the pagan religions, to which it was obviously superior, because it had this understanding of the one God and submission to the one God, and uh, it stopped certain practices like female infanticide and so on. It was obviously more refined than that. It had this understanding of submission to the one God. It rapidly then, by conquest, takes over uh, the Christian uh, areas that had had their own divisions, uh, Nestorian heresy and so on. And here it, it, it is coming uh, to, to Europe. So we've had this massive and very swift rise, and it must have been, seemed almost unstoppable. It must have seemed... Well, I um, think it, 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 in many respects... Um, in its initial stages it not was. only appeared but was unstoppable um, I mean by the time we get to for example uh, the, the beginnings of the 8th century uh, again not long after the Hegira we see the first and only at that early stage defense, successful defense uh, of uh, Christian territory at the battle of Cobadonga uh, which of course most Spaniards will know about um, in which the remnant of the Visigothic kingdom, because by now it's been swept aside and most of Spain is, is in Islamic hands, uh, but the, the remnant under Don Pelagio, uh, which in English would be probably rendered Pelagius, mm. he uh, uh, is elected the first king of Asturias, because Asturias is all that is left by then of Christian Spain. Um, uh, the, the ancient uh, province, Roman province, that was Christianized, uh, he defeats a Muslim army at Cobadonga. And this is generally regarded as the first real Christian victory over the Muslims in that Spanish Reconquista. Um, and uh, it's uh, portrayed as a, as a great event because, precisely because, before that time, the Muslim armies had swept all before them uh, and uh, it seemed to be completely unconquerable. But that didn't stop them. Because even after that, we see them pressing ahead over the Pyrenees and into France. And they, uh, they do this with such success that they get as far as Tours in northern France and they are pretty much uh, within a jump of Paris and of, of, of Reims, Reims the, uh, the city where the French kings were, 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 were uh, were crowned ever since uh, King Clovis, the first Christian king of France. Uh, but at that point, an ancestor of the great Emperor Charlemagne, his, his, his uh, I think, grandfather, Charles Martel, the, uh, uh, Martel means uh, hammer, Charles the hammer, they called him, uh, with, it is said, uh, 1,500 soldiers, halts the Muslim advance, uh, an advance of some 40,000 cavalry at the Battle of Tours and the Muslim cavalry under Abdul Rahman al Ghafiki uh, is, 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 is defeated. And Edward Gibbon, the British historian, uh, no friend of the Christian church, very much uh, an enlightenment figure and a, a secularist uh, way of thinking, even he had this to say about that great uh, uh, battle and what preceded it. He said this, a victorious line of march had been prolonged above a thousand miles from the rock of Gibraltar to the banks of the Loire River. The repetition of an equal space would have carried the Saracens to the confines of Poland and the highlands of Scotland. The Rhine is not more impassable than the Nile or Euphrates and the Arab fleet might have sailed without a naval combat into the mouth of the Thames River. Perhaps then, says Gibbon, the interpretation of the Koran would now be taught in the schools of Oxford and her pulpits might demonstrate to a circumcised people the sanctity and truth of the revelation of Mohammed. That is what Edward Gibbon had to say writing in the 18th century about the prospects in the year, well, a thousand years earlier, in the 8th century, uh, of the Muslim advance if it had not been stopped by Charles Martel in 732. So that gives you a feel for the extent of the threat to Christian Europe, told not by a Christian author, but by an author who himself was an opponent of Christianity. And so this is the 
understanding that we have historically from very uh, early on, we're talking well, well before what we would describe as the Middle Ages, before the Norman conquest of Britain and so on. This, this is the, the reality of these years that precede what we come to speak of as the Crusades, uh, which take place uh, after the year 1000 and, and so on. So we've got this image of this rapidly expanding um, rise of Islam. It, 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 it rises and then it takes by force in, with immense speed. Something that uh, is now going to be confronted by the next chapter as it unfolds with the, the, the Christian response. Well, if it, if it were not, of course, for the likes of Charles Martel and those who then took their theme, if you like, from, from his uh, great defence of, of Tour, then Gibbon is probably right. Most of Europe, if not all of Europe, would simply have fallen to the sword of Islam and would uh, perhaps to this day be is, is, is Islamic and uh, the Christian parts of the world may well have been elsewhere or perhaps been very small. So we're going to have to look next at what happened after the great battle of Tours and Charles Martel and take forward the, the history from there. It's going to be quite a, um, a, an exciting adventure because we've still got some very famous great events in history to explore with names such as the ones we've heard like Gibraltar and Tours and Charles Martel and these other uh, places, Spain and uh, Reconquista and all the rest of it. We're going to watch as this unfolds uh, from the 8th century um, onwards. So we're going to have to turn our attention now back to the holy places and, and see what's going on there. Well, indeed. Join us next time as we explore the Muslim conquest of the holy places and the menace to Christendom. Join us as we continue with the military orders and the Crusades. <laughs>